Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. What inspired me was when I was visiting China. I went through the Museum of Chinese People Resistance Against Japanese Aggression. But what struck me really was a very conscious effort to create an enemy out of Japan in China. The emphasis that is placed in this narrative has changed over time to serve the purpose of international relations, to serve the purpose of the projection of China's image in front of the global community, serve the purpose of the building of the party. In this episode, war museums and the memory industries of China and Japan. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia research specialist at the University of Melbourne. Earlier this year, two Asia Institute researchers, Dr. Delia Lin and Dr. Saoki Tok, toured a number of war museums and memorials in both China and Japan. Their aim was to examine how memories of war are officially portrayed and how such representations may be influenced by more contemporary political concerns. Their destinations included the Chinese city of Nanjing, site of the so-called Nanjing Massacre or the Rape of Nanking, in which up to 300,000 residents were victims of mass murder and rape by Japanese soldiers during the Second Sino-Japanese War. And they visited Japan's Hiroshima, the first city ever to be subject to a nuclear attack, in this case by the United States, killing up to 150,000 people with a single bomb. Other private and public war museums in Beijing and Tokyo also made up part of their itinerary. So to what extent are the facts allowed to speak for themselves in the war museums and commemorative sites in both China and Japan? Are war memories something to be shaped to serve the domestic or international political goals of today? What sort of imagery and language do they use to get their message across? And who is the target of that message? Back from their travels, Dr Delia Lin and Dr Saoki Tok are here in the studio to tell us what they observed. Both our guests are political scientists based at Asia Institute here at the University of Melbourne. Welcome Delia and Saoki. Hello. Hello. Well, this is not your usual tourist itinerary, is it? You very specifically, as we said, went to museums commemorating various horrors at the hands of foreign aggressors. Why? What did you set out to find, Delia? Well, my research focuses on ideology and discourse, so I've been working on texts. Salke and I talked about our common research interests. And we had this opportunity to um, apply for some funds to look at how museums are set up, uh, how images and texts are written out to create certain memories and to write the history. There's common interest there. And so we thought we are able to find something new about how uh, memories are constructed through those museums. To write the history is an interesting way of putting it. To Sarkeet, do you you think is it to reflect the history? Is it to write the history? Is um, it to slant the history? I think Delia's portrayal of using the word write is probably correct in the way that everyone writes their own history. And if you compare the history texts of the regional countries, you realize that even similar episodes of history are portrayed quite differently. And it is up to the historian or the text writer himself or herself to decide what kind of materials to use and uh, what kind of uh, portrayal they prefer to present. And very often this is uh, very much a product of the political and social context of the uh, particular country itself. This has been an ongoing academic pursuit in looking at different versions of history. So this is not something new altogether. But what we are trying to do here is to look at something that is really, we think, uh, understudied in our field, which is about China and Japan, one of the very most contentious uh, events in human history, which is World War II. And that, of course, it raises the question of who owns the narrative, which we'll get to in a minute. But I wanted to ask first, why focus on these museums and why focus on the particular events? You talk about the complexities and the difficulties and the tensions in the relationship, but why focus on the Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II? Why this particular period? Okay, just to help the uh, audience here, this is the second time China was at war. The first time was in 1895 when the First Sino-Japanese War happened. 
And usually World War II was considered as a second Sino-Japanese war. I think history has been mobilized as a political capital in Asia, okay, and in particular between China, Japan, and South Korea, on how the world war history has been used to mobilize people as a way to leverage against each other. But what inspired me was when I was uh, visiting China back in the uh, 2000s, out of chance, I went through the Museum of Chinese People Resistance Against Japanese aggression. Now, that's a handful. But what struck me really was that there had been a very conscious effort to create an enemy out of Japan in China. I I put that in the back of my mind, but um, subsequently I've got this opportunity as what Delia said. So, And and that particular time period seemed most relevant to that study. That's right. It seems most relevant to the study because that is the most contentious part and this part of history keep coming back. Yeah, that's absolutely right because uh, whenever there was a dialogue between China and Japan on some issues, when there was any disagreement, this issue always comes up. And then the narrative is pretty unified. Um, So China always blames uh, Japan for not having recognized the true history of what had happened and hadn't really learned from the mistakes. Uh, Whereas the Chinese, if you look at um, whenever there was some tension between Japan and China, if you look at the response from the Chinese people, uh, usually quite unified as well. And if you look at the cultural industry, the kind of portrayal of the Japanese army and of the war is pretty much unified. So we know the general story, but we don't really know the tactics takes of how they actually do it in museums to create that kind of common sentiment. Yeah, and even within the academic discussion, there is an assumption that in China it's a very top-down process yeah. of how memory is created. But I think uh, the situation, the real situation, is a lot more complex than that because we happen to run into some private museums, even in China. And um, in Japan, most of the museums are privatized. So the whole... the so whole these are memories of the people. These yeah, are not these are, memories of, of, of the, 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 of the, the politicians, nation. of the government. I, I wouldn't even use the word people, but there is a societal effort, societal dynamic to that memory creation. And that is something that we are probably quite interested in. Well, let's look uh, at what you saw, I guess, some of the museums that you visited, and then go back to that question of the societal dynamic. And if we start in Nanjing, the Nanjing Massacre Museum, that's the colloquial term, the official title, is the Memorial Hall of the Victims in Nanjing Massacre by Japanese Invaders. Delia, what were your first impressions? What's it like when you enter the Nanjing Museum? So it's like a passageway. Maybe the better way of describing it is a water canal. It's not a moat in the sense that it's not round. It's just one way. And you have to pass that. You have to walk through it uh, in order to get into the museum. So you don't have a choice. It's very long, 30 metres or 50 metres. You have to walk through it. And on the water, there were many statues of um, mother losing their children or people losing the arms and legs and very disturbing images, disturbing statues. So before you get into the building, your emotions have already been built up. It's not quiet and reflective. It's not quiet and reflective. And you have to go through it. You cannot choose not to. And also you can't stop. You can't sit uh, by uh, by the water to think about it. You have to walk through it in order to get into the building. So before you even went into the building, you were already overwhelmed by sorrow and suffering of the people. It's a very uh, vivid museum. Vivid. Everything is very much laid out. There are very precise details. There were the precise details. And there was not much space for you to really reflect on um, what this history would impact on you. You were drawn into that sorrow, that suffering, and it's impossible not to feel... um, ruined almost um, after you get out of the museum. Some people might feel the hatred, some people might feel... Towards the Japanese. Towards the Japanese, and some people might feel terrible about what had happened. But suffering is the key theme uh, that has gone through the displays and the ways that uh, that the story was told. Yeah, I, I think there is a strong sense of reflection in Hiroshima, whereas uh, there's a stronger sense of channeling 
when mm. we visited uh, the uh, Nanjing Massacre Museum. So it's, it's very much up to the setup of the place, as in how the process of leading you into the exhibits, I think that was one of them. But on top of that is also how the exhibits were being organised. The way that Hiroshima was being organised is more like in terms of the technologies, the different after effects. It gives you a more textbook version of what happened. You know, but the central piece of the Peace Park is actually the dome itself. And this is was, the dome in Hiroshima, the one surviving building. That's that, right, that's right. And walking around the dome, and in our case, we went on a very interesting snowing. day where it was snowing in Hiroshima. It gives you the feeling that history just froze, that the atomic bomb fell on top of it, everything just froze in time. It, it gives you a sense that. What have we done to ourselves? What have we done to, to other people? And you didn't, at Nanjing, you didn't get that sense? Was I it think more? What, and in fact, Nanjing is, is a tourist park, isn't it? I mean, it, it is, is a tourist attraction, officially labelled a tourist attraction. It, it's officially labelled as a tourist attraction. And uh, according to last figure, I think it was 2015 figure, it was second to Tiananmen in terms of the number of visitors in China. But the whole process in Nanjing was that It gives you a very, very raw feeling of hurt. Everything is right in your face. You know, the brutality, the skeletons that were unearthed subsequently. I think think it is... The ash, everything. The ash. Yeah, Yeah, I think it is important to have that. But the feeling is that there has been a lot of effort to prove this is the actual thing. So it's really more about the brutality of the Japanese than it is about memorialising the individuals, the victims. Yeah, so um, I totally agree with the Saki's observation, especially the word channelling is the key word. And also in Chinese museums, that large, uh, not just uh, the Nanjing Massacre Museum, is that there was a very clear theme. There was a paradigm um, built in those museums. So there was one story that you need to get out of this. So with Nanjing Massacre Museum is the brutality of the Japanese towards the Chinese and also caution sent to the Chinese population that Japan might do it again. Materialism is growing in Japan and we need to be careful of that. And so you think that, that is the clear message? That's a clear message. Rather than the general message of humanity, uh, what we need to learn about humanity, how how do we protect humanity and the evilness of the war itself, regardless who is doing against whom? So that and raises an interesting question, though, that if it is very deliberately designed to act as a warning, if you like, has that always been the message? Has this museum, and indeed, when was this museum established, has it changed over time as the, the political imperatives have changed? Or has it been a constant theme? I think there has been changes. Museums are not static venues. They do change over time as new materials were uncovered, uh, the new curators come in to understand materials differently, the artefacts differently. But one thing about Nanjing Massacre Museum is that Nanjing Massacre as a research enterprise didn't really take off until the 1980s. There had been work. The first materials about Nanjing Massacre came out in the 1950s. But at that time, everything was still preliminary. They are not entirely sure. And China was taken by the social uh, engineering projects under Mao era at that time. So there was very little take up on those research. Then subsequently, 1970s, when more concrete evidences turn up, they were suppressed by the uh, Chinese government because of the Sino-Japanese ties. They were establishing the uh, Sino-Japanese ties. Things were improving, so it wasn't helpful to... In 1972, Tanaka and Mao. Then only in the 80s, when Japanese prime minister started to visit the Yashikuni Shrine, that, that China took it an effort to expand on the research on Nanjing Massacre. So there was a conscientious effort. If you trace the architecture, the current Nanjing Massacre Museum, it was not where it was previously. So it was moved to that location only in, if my memory served me right, it was only moved in the 2000s. So previously it was on a smaller site, then it moved over there just to make it a bigger venue. But what I'm really trying to say is 
things do change and the narratives do change over time. So in our research, we also have to be very careful about the context. The context was the history portrayed. of the history itself. There can be many papers really written out of it, depending on what our angle is. But really, history of writing history itself is very interesting. And the narrative uh, certainly has changed over time, and the emphasis that is placed in this narrative has changed over time to serve the purpose of international relations, to serve the purpose of the projection of China's image in front of the global community, serve the purpose of the building of the party. What is on the high agenda of the party building? And that's something we need to take into account. Uh, that's why we're fascinated with our research and we sort of really complement each other because my research has been focused on domestic politics, where South has been focused on international relations. So combining our expertise and also perspective together, we, we actually find some fascinating um, observations there. Delia, I'd like to correct you a little bit. You have been <laughs> focusing too much on China. I also want to emphasize that Yashikuni Shrine you yes, know, the yeah, experience and- at Yashikuni Shrine is absolutely interesting. And we, we need to explain exactly what the Yasukuni Shrine is and the role that it's played in uh, bilateral relations. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by political scientists Dr Delia Lin and Dr Saki Tok. We're talking about how wartime history is portrayed and to what purpose in war museums in China and Japan. Saki, uh, now the Yasukuni Shrine has been at the centre of uh, extraordinary tension between China and Japan Can you tell us why? Give us the background. The uh, Yashikuni Shrine was, uh, in the first place, the place of worship for the uh, Shinto religion. Now, Shinto religion really pretty much backed up the emperor, the emperor structure in Japan on the belief that the emperor is right at the apex of uh, Japan society. During the Meiji Restoration period, Shinto was promoted by the state in order to consolidate the power of uh, the emperor in Japan. So in this case, the uh, Yashikuni Shrine was set up as a way to commemorate those who have sacrificed in the name of the emperor. In other words, the imperial forces of the Japanese army. Yeah, the imperial forces of the Japanese army, not just until World War II, but extending from Meiji Restoration right all up to today. But the controversy from China's point of view is that many of these soldiers who are enshrined there are considered to be war criminals. They are. And it's not just that. The Yashikuni Shrine is one thing. There is a separate uh, There's a, museum. There's the Yushikan War Memorial. Yushikan yeah. War Museum, that's right. So if you walk through the Yushikan War Museum, you realise that there is a lot of justification of World War II going on. Of Japan's position? Of Japan's position of why these people have done what they did during World War II. It's really about, oh, they're doing it in the name of the emperor. The emperor wanted it. So, you know, there's a greater deed that they're they're serving. Rather than focusing on the brutality, the, the, yeah, the consequences of the war, there's a greater deed that we should all revert. That is the focus of it. And they did try to talk about the Nanjing Massacre, the China incident, in a very... They call, they call it a China incident. Maybe just one line. They call the massacre the, uh, the incident. China incident. The but China how, incident. So how does that sit with Hiroshima? How do you line up the story told and the emotion that is inspired by a museum such as Hiroshima with the Yushikan War Memorial Museum? I think we have to look at um, the construct of the the different forces that were behind these two different museums. Now, the Yashikuni Shrine Museum is supported by the Shinto religious group. Now, there's a very interesting historical background here. Because after the war, the Japanese constitution forbids state to directly intervene in cultural religious groups in Japan. That was consciously built into Japanese constitution. And Shintoism grew out to have a life on its own. You can call it the enterprise, you can call it the industry, religious industry, but there is this effort to try to 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 make it continue to be relevant to today's Japan. But are you suggesting that the Yushikan Museum and the Yasukuni Shrine is removed from the political realm? No. In fact, I'll say that there is a certain societal force within Japan that is pushing for a kind of particular narrative. And the, the Yasukuni Shrine is merely a mouthpiece of that force. 
Now, when you compare it to uh, what's happening in Hiroshima, there is another social force at large over there, one which was anti-war, anti-nuclear in particular. And it was supported very much by the Hiroshima government. Now, Hiroshima Prefecture government has long been at odds with the central government in terms of Hiroshima and what happened and everything. So at that level, there is political competition of the narrative. So the, so the single narrative, Delia, that you talk about in China is not so apparent in Japan? Uh, no, because you can even see from the text in Japan that there was competition, there was political competition, there was debate. They even talk about that debate in some of the scripts. So you can actually see the history of it. Um, and also, if you go to the shrine, it's a Shinto place. It's a place where people commemorate the death. But of course, the story there focuses on uh, the loss of the soul for the emperor. That's very clear. Rather than the suffering of the soldiers, rather than the suffering of the people, it was a pure sacrifice for the emperor who uh, was virtuous, perhaps. So there was this kind of transcendental uh, feeling that you get from there. So the story was pretty much downplayed, even if they had a narrative of the massacre called China incident. But the story, the narrative, the history of it is pretty much downplayed. Do you agree with Sarkeet, though, about how that that has inspired uh, the Chinese, that, that there was a switch. This is when the, the Nanjing Museum was moved, that the focus is in some ways a response to how Japan perceives its past. Um, that's what China says. That is because the way that Japan reacts to the war. Do you think that that's right? I Well, you need to look at the timeline. Who comes first? How they respond to the other people's perceived responses. But I think what we need as scholars, we need to be careful, is also look at the context in which those museums were built within the country rather than just listening to the external uh, official forces. external forces and, and look at uh, this uh, official rhetoric of the reason why we build it. Because if we visit those museums, talk to those people, we constantly hear that they do this as a response to Japan's response to the war. Um, but it's actually deeper than that. Sakit mentioned earlier this societal thing. I mean, there are survivors still in China. So this is something that comes from people themselves. Yeah, coming from people themselves. And I have to say that I feel sorrow uh, when listening to or or looking at how the survivors were used. Uh, um, I really would like to use the word used to tell those stories. I feel terrible because in China, we also visited our comfort women museums in Nanjing uh, as well. We were there also listening to people give testimonials about what had happened, both in Japan and in China. We just happened to be there when those testimonials were held. And also we subscribed to uh, the WeChat group of this museum so we could follow the stories after our visit because there were not many surviving comfort women in China now and they're very old and they come from villages. If you look at how those stories were told and how those people were invited to give those stories, uh, there was a strong sense of um, them being used to tell a national narrative without really looking at the individual suffering and the pain these women had to go through throughout their whole lives and including their own children and the awful situation they were in and the poor living conditions they're in and what the government is going to do about that. There's absolutely nothing about that part. Those people were found in remote villages living in horrible condition throughout their whole lives after the war. Uh, of course, I mean, they are suffering during the Second World War and they were used as comfort women or they were raped. That's absolutely horrifying. Uh, but then they would actually tell the story of the whole miserable life and place the blame on Japan. So they were serving without, a purpose. They were serving a purpose. And that's what I found extremely disturbing because when you ask those women, some of them are close to 100 or 90 years old, 80 year olds, and they've had absolutely miserable life throughout their entire life. Discrimination against them from the government, but also from people around them throughout their life. That's not registered. That's absolutely. not talked about at all. I, I like to share my experience with the uh, Comfort Women Museum in Korea. Now, the Comfort Museum in Korea is a privately run museum. There's a two-story house right out in the suburbs of Seoul. It was privately run. The government doesn't sponsor that museum at all. 
I talked to the、uh, curator by chance, and she was saying, "Oh, the government they just had one project with the."、Uh, Government and that's it. You know, a hundred thousand dollars and that's about it. So the rest they, of the time, it's private donations. It's private. They they done everything through private donations and they were forced to move from one place in another because the society refused to accept that museum in their precinct. And yet, when everything elevates to Korea and Japan relations, you know, suddenly these comfort women became symbols of that struggle against Japanese colonization. So it's like. Back at home, they were discriminated. They didn't get the kind of welfare that they deserve out from the state, and yet all the blames were put on the Japanese. And the Japanese is almost like Japanese should be doing everything for these people. So, of course, that's a private museum, which brings up the question of the private museum and the role that they play. You visited、uh, private museums in both countries, Delia. In in China, were they noticeably different? Tell us a little about the ones that you visited. Yeah, so other noticeably different from the national museums.、Uh, I think yes, you can easily observe the differences. Of course, they're not in a in a very good building, and it's pretty much artifacts focused.、Uh, they've. Displayed some objects and not really professionally curated. I don't know how Saki、uh, views that. And of course, they can't use any high technology. They don't have the money. They don't have the money. And the、um, Nanjing director we、um, interviewed, he said very clearly, all the money comes from his own investment、uh, into properties and into. So, what was this museum commemorating? War,、uh, Japan-China war, and why did he feel strongly that he needed an alternative museum? Yeah, it's a great question.、Um, so we did ask the question: What had motivated you if you're using your own money? And he's a very, very busy man. He's extremely motivated and very passionate. What had motivated him? I believe it seems that he's not entirely happy with how this history is portrayed by. The government in those government museums that he doesn't believe that the Japanese actually believe in the war, doesn't believe that there has been enough narrative told about how the people in Nanjing and how how the Chinese civilians suffered from the war, and also the admission. Of this war crime by Japan, so he's got that mission in in the back of his mind, and he even takes his group funded by himself to Japan to exhibit. So he just wants the public to know what had happened. What so it's believed, a more factual representation. It's more factual representation in his perspective, and he he deliberately in all those display of those artifacts. He deliberately he said, "You can see the difference between、uh, my exhibition, my my museum, to other museums. I just try to tell the fact." Let people make up their mind, and I don't make any story out of this. I, I just is he under、objects. any pressure to make a story? It's I would imagine a private museum. Perhaps I'm wrong, but a private museum in China is an interesting enterprise. I think it's a very delicate relationship that they have with the government. We do see signs of socialist core values in his museum. Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, and I said, why do you have all this? Because from his interview, he's very careful with what he says, and he's very, very subtle in his statements. But where does that truth that he believes comes from? That's another question. The truth of the war has not been made clear to the general public. Is it the same in Japan with private museums, Saki? Do you think is it a different narrative? Well,、is、to be、it? fair, I think the、um, the museums in Japan, other than the national museums, are all private. So even the、uh, Hiroshima is a public one, but it's a prefectural effort rather than a national effort. So as what Delia said earlier on, there's a lot more debate. There's a lot more competition between different narratives, which is all too fascinating to see. One that I like to raise, which is the Tokyo Fire Bombing Museum, which is a again a very very small museum. Is this, this is again a, one of those public museums. Is it locally run? It's, it's, it's a, a private, private museum. That one is a totally private museum. It was located in really one of those outlying suburbs in Tokyo. It took us hours just to get there. And if we look at the narratives of Tokyo bombing, there has been very very little. Talks exhibits about Tokyo bombing, even though it killed more people than the nuclear bomb at Hiroshima. What is going on here? There was very little people talking about that, but doesn't mean that that part of history didn't happen. You know, when we get there, it's like we、we'll、start to realize that yes, there was this important part where usually in a textbook we just one line one or line. a paragraph that talks about. You know, you know, yeah, it happened. Tokyo bombing, fire bombing, no reflection, no, but no reflection at all. 
I think we're seeing a variety of narrative rather than one single track of narrative. We're seeing multiple tracks of narrative ongoing at the same time. And that is for a history geek like myself. I enjoy that process of entertaining different perspectives. Of history, I think what's common between Japan and China is obviously seeing that different perspective displayed by people by the society、uh, shows that there was a lack of recognition of different perspectives and different understanding of the history. This I think both nations perhaps lack that space, and that's why we we see those privately funded museums even in its own small scale, and people are doing their bits to. Remember what they want to remember. Yeah, I think when we look at the private one, both in Japan and China, there has been greater sense of reflection. The Yashikuni Shrine being the exception is more like a classroom than a, a reflective piece of exhibit. Whereas in China's case, the Nanjing Massacre Museum as well as the Second World War Museum in Beijing, they were all classrooms. And the party didn't hide the fact that these are classrooms. In fact, if when you walk into the、uh, Nanjing Massacre Museum, the first line that comes to you is、uh, Xi Jinping said, "This is a classroom for all humankind." Right? You, when you walk through this, this is the class that you are supposed to take. It serves a public education purpose. The Shikuni Shrine seems to coincide with that. But the other private ones, whether they are in China or in Japan, I think there is a lot more reflections going on that they are want to bring and out. And a lot of personal reflections. Yes, as well. personal, personal reflections, reflections. The personal stories, average people, the lives of average people, how they were touched by the war. Uh, and they feel there was a lack of it in those、yeah. national museums. So, so when we started this podcast in the introduction, I talked about the memory industry. Is there, Delia, a memory industry? Do you think after your visits to these museums?、Um, I think I'll be very careful with the word industry because when we talk about industry, we don't automatically link it to government. We don't automatically link it to a political agenda behind this. Because industry is a manufacturing enterprise, and with a very clear purpose, but also to、uh, try to make it appeal to the market.、Uh, there was an element of that,、uh, absolutely, in China and in Japan, especially in China. How to channel people's thought, how to entice people into this museum and get something out of it. There was a lot of effort being built into manufacturing this great product.、Uh, so, in that sense, yes, there was a bit of industry. But I think industry doesn't encapsulate. The purpose, the drive behind this, but it is industry in the sense that it is a manufacturing process to manufacture a particular product.、Uh, so that's definitely the strong element of that. No,、uh, Salkita, a product. I use the word industry because I also see that there is economics behind all these projects. There is a huge industry in China, for example. You can call it propaganda industry, you can call it education, whatever. But there is a huge industry in China that is promoting this narrative, and the state is putting in a lot of money in order to get these things going. And the consumers, being the general public, who Went through. Who knows that there are such places of exhibits? They went through the process. They went through the education, and they consume those narratives that come through. I see industry in that sense. And manufacturing or not, I don't want to get into that mind zone. You know, the Chinese will always remind you that they are not manufacturing everything. Those are facts. But we do see that there has been conscious effort to put facts. In a particular way, in、and、order to frame it, frame, frame it, it, frame it in、exactly. a particular way. Context to- is everything. Delia Lin and Sanki Tok, thank you very much for your time. Great thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much, Alan. Our guests have been Asia Institute political scientists Dr. Sanki Tok and Dr. Delia Lin. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify, or SoundCloud. And if you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And of course, let your friends know about us on social media. This episode was. Was recorded on the fifteenth of March, twenty nineteen. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Parham of Profactual dot com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright twenty nineteen, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.